Hello. On behalf of the Cincinnati Art Museum, thank you for joining tonight's Artist Talk by Countess B. Winfrey, co-organized by the Museum and Ohio Dance. My name is Emily Bauman. I'm the Curatorial Assistant for Photography and I'm a member of the Curatorial and Learning and Interpretation teams at the Cincinnati Art Museum who are serving the exhibitions, David Driscoll, Icons of Nature and History, and Working Together, the Photographers of the Kamange Workshop. If you are joining our program live and have not yet visited these exhibitions, I hope that you'll come to enjoy these artworks in person. Both exhibitions continue through May 15th. A note for our audience members, we welcome your participation and we invite you to submit your questions using the Microsoft form available on the event page. Submit your questions at any time and we will respond to as many as we can during the Q&A segment that follows the talk. In just a few moments, I will introduce our honored speaker who will talk about her process creating homage, what was, is, to come. The Black Futures series capstone performance, which will premiere at the museum on May 6th. The Black Futures series includes happenings, performances, and conversations inspired by David Driscoll and by the photographers of the Kamangi Workshop. All artists who prioritize mentorship relationships, who created exhibition and publication opportunities for Black artists, and who were active participants in writing African-American art history. It has been our great privilege here at the museum to work in partnership with the organizations Artworks, Cincy Nice, Ohio Dance, the Robert O'Neill Multicultural Art Center, and Wordplay Cincy to bring you this series. And tonight's program is specifically indebted to work together with Rodney Beal and Jane D'Angelo of Ohio Dance. The Black Futures series is supported by LPK and GBBN. Additional support has been provided by Ohio Humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Federal ARP Act of 2021. Countess V. Winfrey's Artist Talk is supported by the Arts Midwest Gig Fund, a program of Arts Midwest that is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts with additional contributions from Ohio Arts Council. In October 2021, the Cincinnati Art Museum and Ohio Dance issued a request for proposals for new dance work that expresses the enduring centrality and necessity of Black creativity. And in January, a panel of adjudicators selected Winfrey's as the winning project, a site-specific work that draws the audience through three spaces of the museum, reflecting on Black past, present, and future. But you should hear about this in the artist's words. And so now I would like to introduce Countess V. Winfrey. A native of Nashville, Winfrey is in her seventh season working with Dayton Contemporary Dance Company, DCDC, where she currently serves as professional dancer, teaching artist, choreographer, and rehearsal director. She has taught and choreographed at institutions including Oyo Dance Company, the School of the Creative and Performing Arts, the Ohio State University, Miami University, the University of Memphis, and the International Association of Blacks and Dance Conference. And her career highlights include performing at the Bolshoi Theater and at Lincoln Center. She has performed works by choreographers, including Ulysses Dove, Donald McHale, Ray Mercer, Dwight Roden, Ronald K. Brown, Diane McIntyre, and Donald Byrd. Countess, welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Emily. Hello everyone, um, I am very excited to embark on this artist talk this evening, so thank you for joining me. Um, I would actually like to start with a little bit of a movement practice, a little bit of breathing, a little bit of moving, uh, just to kind of get us started for the evening. Um, if you plan to stay for both sessions, we have um, a good long evening ahead of us. So I thought it might be nice to start with a little movement and then we'll get started. So you can start with your hands by your side and feel free to participate or just watch if you would like. And we're just going to start with some nice deep breathing. So take a nice deep inhale. And exhale. We'll do it twice more just like that. Deep inhale. And exhale. Last time like this. Deep inhale. And exhale. Good. On this next inhale, you're going to take your hands up to the ceiling. Deep breath in. 
and exhale it out, lower those hands down. Very nice. Twice more, just like that. Deep breath in. And exhale it out. Last time, deep breath in. And exhale it out. Good. Last thing we're going to do, moving in those shoulders. Deep breath in. And exhale it out. Twice more. Deep breath in. And exhale. Last time, deep breath in. And exhale it out. And shake it out. Good. All right, everyone. So I'm going to get started. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for that um, that bio or sharing some information from my bio. I am still going to kind of go through a little bit of my life history. I think that's always nice to know about different artists. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the choreography that I've done uh, prior to this project. And then I'm going to go into talking about um, what attracted me to this particular project and what I'm most excited about uh, in, in embarking on this journey. Um, so I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I attended um, an arts middle school, Warden Arts Middle School, and I also attended Nashville School of the Arts. And uh, I would say that Nashville School of the Arts is really where my like core dance training began. Um, I was a part of a dance studio in middle school, and I did a little bit of dancing in middle school, but high school is where I really got serious about it and got focused. And um, I started to really see what the beauty and the magic is behind dance. Um, I had some really wonderful teachers that were very um, inspiring to me and to my journey, my journey and have even still um, really heavily impacted my artistic journey even today. So I, I really enjoyed my experience there. Um, after high school, I went to the University of Memphis and I majored in exercise and sports sciences, and I got a minor in dance, and uh, and it was a great experience. Memphis definitely wasn't my first choice because they didn't have um, a major in dance, and I wasn't able to take like a lot of really heavy training classes. But I'm so grateful that I went to University of Memphis because that's where I first learned about DCDC. My junior year of college, um, my college professor brought DCDC in to do a performance and workshop series with us. And I was just so amazed as to what I was seeing. I had never seen black concert dance like that. And I knew as soon as I had that experience with them that I was going to be trying to audition. So, <laughs> uh, so prior to uh, post-college, I uh, came and auditioned for the second company of DCDC, the pre-professional ensemble. Um, and then I moved here. And uh, so I've been here since 2012. I did the second company for two seasons. And then I got the opportunity to apprentice with the first company, which was really wonderful. Um, and then after that, I moved to Washington, D.C. And I danced with a different company there called Clancy Works Dance Company. Um, and that was a wonderful experience. Um, Washington, D.C. is a beautiful city. It was my first time living in such a big city by myself, and um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but after a year, I got a call to come back to D.C., D.C., and I jumped in the car and threw all my stuff in the apartment into the U-Haul <laughs> and came back speedily. So, um, so now I'm in my seventh season with the company as a professional dancer, and it has been a really wonderful experience. And as Emily mentioned, we have been all over the world. And uh, and luckily, before the pandemic, we got to do a lot of that traveling. Um, and it's it's been a really cool experience. And I would say um, a lot of my experience in the company has really uh influenced and guided my choreographic journey. So choreography for me uh, was not my first interest. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I really love choreographing now, um, but it used to feel very scary. And it was almost like, I don't know. I think there was just there were so many unknowns about it because it's not like class where someone's giving you, you know, the technique to work on. And it's not like, um, you know, being the dancer where you're doing somebody else's vision. It's like 
it's all you. And, you know, there's a lot of vulnerability that comes to choreographing or comes with choreographing. So it was definitely something that um, I didn't throw myself into, uh, but I definitely think that I was I was called to do it. And I'm so grateful that I've gotten the opportunity to. So um, the first piece that I choreographed was actually at a company that I was dancing for in Memphis, Tennessee called Bridging Souls. And the director just asked me to make a work. And so I did. And I definitely don't know that I loved it. And I'm sure looking back at it, that was almost 10 years ago. I'm sure I would probably be like, you know, shielding my eyes from it. Um, But it was cool. It was a cool, it was a learning experience for sure. And the thing that I've learned about being a choreographer is that it has helped me as a performer as well. I like, I I pay more attention. I understand a little bit more of what the choreographer is trying to get at because now I'm, I'm on both sides of the table. Um, so it's definitely been, um, an interesting journey. Uh, once I got to Dayton, um, I was working at a couple of different local studios. So I would do, you know, choreography for recitals and maybe some competitions. Um, but I didn't really start choreographing for a concert dance until my second year as a professional company member here. Um, And my director just asked me to create a work for a school show, a school program that we were doing called The People Could Fly. And I was like, okay, so I'll give it a shot. And it was cool because it was a different kind of experience getting to work with the professionals rather than working with students. Um, Not better, not worse, just different. And so, uh, I remember making that piece and wondering if it was good. And and I guess it got a pretty good response because um, later in that fall, I would get to choreograph my first main stage piece along with one of my colleagues, Carrie and Blair. And that piece was called Stepping Into Season. And this was maybe for both of us. I think this was both of our first like big main stage piece that we got to do on a DC DC concert. And um, it was it was wonderful. And we got to have a live band for some portions of the piece. Um, and it was a 30 minute piece. So it was the kind of anchor for that particular show. Uh, and it was a really great learning experience on both sides. Um, anyone who is a professional dancer and also a choreographer, it can be a tricky balance to be, you know, teaching your friends. <laughs> um, but it's it's also a really like wonderful growing experience, I think, for both sides. Um, so that was my first like major piece that I did. And then consequently, the next season when we went to when we went overseas and we went to Kazakhstan, uh, both she and I got to create a piece on the Kazina Dance Company, which is a, um, a company based out of Shimkent, Kazakhstan. And uh, that was a really cool experience because they didn't speak our language and we didn't speak their language and we only had the language of dance to really um, be the sharing space. And so that experience um, choreographically was definitely one that I, I treasure, that I keep in mind as I continue to choreograph new pieces. Um, one of the first big commissions or opportunities that I got in choreographing and, and directing a bit, uh, was a commission I got from my alma mater, actually. It was, um, at the University of Memphis and, uh, the woman who was in the, uh, minority affairs department just messaged me and she was like, Hey, can you bring some dance to the University of Memphis for Black History Month? And, I was like, oh, OK. And she she gave me full free reign and a huge budget. So I gathered some dance friends and I contacted the dance department that I used to dance with and um, another friend who danced in a local African dance company. And we had a 30 minute long program that uh, that I got to you know produce. And it was one of my first like big opportunities. And so um, I definitely attribute that that opportunity as something that has helped me to be, be more brave about taking on like really big projects. Um, so that was um, that was a really wonderful experience that has led to uh, some of my other works that I think really uh, I got to dive into as far as um, what I'm interested in and exploring concepts that I was interested in that are deeply embedded into my root system. So I'm going to talk about two of those pieces that actually I used to um, apply for this particular project as well. So the first piece that um, I want to talk about is called Somewhere They Freed Themselves. And this particular piece was a piece that I choreographed on Ohio State University. And uh, it was it came along with the opportunity to be a visiting artist at the university. So 
it was a cool experience in that um, it happened during the pandemic and the person who was supposed to be the visiting artist that year was actually coming from Israel. And obviously because of the pandemic and travel, they weren't able to make it. So subsequently myself and another company member got to hold that spot. And so I got to have a little taste of college professor life. I taught classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I also got to set this wonderful work. Um, So when I was starting to think about what work I wanted to make on the students, um, at the same time, the election was happening and I was like, oh, wow, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what my piece is going to be about. And I'm not a very political person, but I was very deeply um, inspired by watching Kamala Harris become the first woman of color vice president. And the first thing I said to myself was like, wow, she has a seat at the table. Like she has a seat at that table. And it was just it was so inspiring to me. I was so I I was just in awe that something like of this measure had happened. And so I wanted to make a piece about it. And when I was thinking about making this piece, though, I also thought about making sure that the students that I was working with were involved in this work. So it wasn't just my voice as an African-American woman, but they also were able to incorporate their voice too. So we had a lot of conversations about, one, what it means to have a seat at the table and how our individual um, lineages have to do with how we have a seat at that table and when we were able to get a seat at that table. So we got into a lot of deep discussion about enslavement and migration and hierarchical systems and how that has um, infiltrated and affected the way that we have moved through life. And uh, and it was a really good opportunity, I think, for the students to also just be involved in the work. Um, so I'm just going to show a quick clip of this. Uh, the piece is about 11 minutes long, <laughs> so I'm only going to show a minute and a half trailer of it. Um, but it has three sections. The first section is called Migration. The second section is called artificial hierarchy. And the third section of the piece is called a seat at the table. So I'm just going to show this trailer. And here we go. wonderful thing um, about getting to do that work was that I got to work with my brother, Wesley Winfrey, who is a jazz musician and composer, and he created all the music for that. And um, we were in preparation for another big project that we just uh, world premiered, actually, with the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. But uh, this was kind of like our, our time to get to practice our, our creation skills together. And um, I was really pleased with the way that that particular piece came out. Uh, Wesley will also be in, involved with this project that I'm gonna be working on at the Cincinnati Art Museum.
All right. The next piece that I want to just kind of talk about and also uh, show a clip of is called Nourishing Roots. And this particular piece is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I didn't realize this piece would be around as long as it has been, um, but it's really gotten to have a, a long life. And I hope that it continues having a, a long life. Um, I created this piece originally for the Black History Month program that I was referring to earlier at the University of Memphis. And uh, it was meant to just kind of be a trio that we did to kind of end the program in a wonderful way. And um, now it's become a part of our DCDC rep that we have been carrying for the past couple of years. And um, it's gotten to grow and expand into a really, really wonderful work that I feel proud of. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what this work uh, stems from. Uh, to me, this work is an homage to our ancestors who laid the paths of knowledge, wisdom, endurance, and faith for my generation to experience the life and the opportunities that we have today. Um, as you'll see in the video, um, there's these flower petals that the dancers spread around the stage. And those flower petals represent the breadcrumbs that were left for us to find our way. So this piece for me makes me think about you know, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great grandparents, my great great grandparents and all the things that they did that have led to me being able to have this experience that I'm having today as an African-American woman um, and particularly as an African-American woman in art and in, as an artist. So um, this uh, piece is actually about eight minutes long. So I'm just going to, again, just show a quick little trailer of it. But it's in two sections. The first section is a poem that was written by my father. It's called An African Proverb. And my brother is actually playing um, the saxophone arrangement that's underneath it. And the second section is to a song by Laura Mavula called Bread. And you'll hear that song in this clip. There we go. So you might have noticed that in this particular filming that we had them dancing in different sections. And so this piece um, actually was created for stage. But when we were in the pandemic, uh, DCDC, we, we did a virtual series and we filmed this virtual series at the Dayton Art Institute uh, located in Dayton. And um, I thought it would have been very interesting to see this piece be performed in different sections of the museum. And each section had something to do with allowing the story of this uh, of the piece to be told. And so this was one of my first experiences with getting to um, see my choreography in a museum setting. And so it feels like it was it was appropriate. I didn't know that it would um, that one day I'd be doing this, but um, I'm so glad that I had that experience. And I think that I'll take a lot of um, things that I learned from putting dance into a site-specific work at a museum, even there, I'll take that with me as I'm working on this new project. So 
Moving into the new project, I am very, very excited to be embarking on this journey of working on this new project at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Um, one of the things that first attracted me to uh, wanting to apply for this particular uh, commission was the fact that I love museums. I like I really, really love museums. And I think it's because when I was younger, I used to draw a lot. Like visual art was really one of the first forms of art that I grafted towards. Um, in fact, when I went to Warden Arts Magnet Middle School, the art that I did first before dance was visual art. Because when we used to take long car trips or even, you know, if I was just in the house, I used to love drawing or painting or doing something with my hands. And so I think that that love for visual art has never left me. Um, and so whenever we go on tour or whenever I'm on vacation in a different city, I always at least try to go to at least one art museum. When I lived in D.C., I used to love going to the Smithsonian. That was like that was my jam. I used to and I used to love taking people there when they would come to visit me. Um, so, yeah, museums have always um, been a place of interest for me. Uh, and the other thing that really drew me to this particular call was that it was going to I was going to be able to make a site specific work. And I've done a lot of site specific work in my career. And it's one of the forms of dancing that I just love the most. I love dancing outside. I love bringing movement to areas where you don't normally see dance because dance just has this way of, of, of bringing life, just bringing forth life to any area that touches it. So um, to get the opportunity to create um, a work that could be seen in a beautiful setting of a museum was just like, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope I get this opportunity. <laughs> um, the other thing that really challenged me about this that I think really attracted me to this particular proposal um, was that most of my work thus far has been centered around the Black experience from the perspective of looking at it in the past. Um, I very seldomly think about what our, our Black future looks like. And as you know, this is a part of the Black future series. So a lot of the questions that they asked were in and around why Black creativity is so important to a Black future or to our Black futures. And I was really interested in diving into this concept for myself and asking myself those questions like what does a black future look like and particularly what does my black future look like what does it smell like what does it taste like what does it feel like and what do you want to see and i you can get very used to making work based off of what you have already seen or what you've already experienced or what what has already been done and then maybe making your own version of that um but for me, very seldom we have somebody ask me, well, what do you want it to look like in the future? Um, and so I, I, as I was writing this proposal, I really took the time to think about how, what that looks like. Um, and as I was doing my research, um, I decided to really dive into the work of the Kamwangi Workshop and David Driscoll, um, who I think are amazing, amazing artists. Um, when I first started listening to some of their interviews, I was just astounded by what they had to say and about how the Black experience really infiltrated into their art and into how they decided to portray art. Um, and they're both, they're very different. They, they're coming from very different perspectives and vantage points. And I, I really liked how it, it took my mind to different thoughts and it inspired me in different ways. So I'm just gonna show um, a little bit of the artwork that uh, David Driscoll has and some of the artwork that the Kamwangi Workshop has. Um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about why their artwork was so inspiring to me and how it will really um, impact the development of this project.
So something that I really have enjoyed about David Driscoll's work, um, a lot of it is just beautifully colorful paintings. Um, This particular uh, painting is a self-portrait that he made of himself. Uh, And it's interesting because this self-portrait to me, even from what I've read about him and from the interviews that I watched, is definitely his demeanor. He has this kind of like, uh, you know, casualness about the way that he talks, but he's also like, very matter of fact, and uh, and he's clear, and he doesn't feel too taken away by anything in particular. But what he makes his work about are things that are important to him, and the things that he makes his work about are you know spirituality and nature and um, and and the things that he experienced as an African American. Um, and I, 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 when I, every, every piece of work that I saw by him, I was just completely drawn in by. Uh, this particular work um, I saw when I was doing my research and it was interesting because when I saw it, I was like, oh, I've seen this woman before. I've seen this woman holding these flowers. And, and even the idea of like her having her eyes closed, I was like, wow, there's something about this that feels like I've already experienced this before. So it was really wonderful to see that it was a moment in time that he captured. Um, Hymnals are something that I know uh, very well and true being that I'm from the South. And so when I saw this uh, painting and I saw that it was inspired by Swing Low Sweet Chariot, I was really attracted to it. In addition, the colors and the idea of the hands going towards the sun, um, this piece in particular has definitely made its way into my research process for my work for this um, museum project. This was another piece that I was really interested in by him. Just the colors of it and the idea of incorporating nature was something that really captured me. And this piece in particular, um, I really enjoyed as well. And the African masks that he shows in this piece It's something that I've been thinking about um, as I'm trying to think about incorporating parts of our African-American history into into this new work. So the Kamoyi Workshop, they are a group of photographers and their work has this way of like exploding. And it has so many each to me, each photograph that I've seen by them has layers and layers and layers and layers of meaning behind each photograph. So I'm just going to show a couple of photos that that really stuck out to me that I enjoyed that I that I want to incorporate into different aspects of this work. This picture, again, similar to the woman with flowers, there was something about this picture that I've seen before. It reminds me of a picture that I've seen in my grandmother's house. Um, of just a woman alive. And they have this way of capturing people in a very natural essence. And even in their naturalness, there's something that they're saying that the, that the subject matter is saying either with their eyes or with their face or with their body language. This piece in particular, I did also really enjoy. I love seeing the little girl come down the steps with her church hat on and her church socks. I've had that same outfit on at some point in my life. Um, and this, this work just really, uh, it really stuck out to me. This piece in particular, this isn't, I don't have the best photo of it, but in the larger photo, um, you can see that the, the little boy in the background is looking straight at the camera and the little girl is looking in another direction. And it made me think about the idea of my brother's keeper, my sister's keeper, um, the importance of a family and the bond that can happen in the siblingship. And when you're really looking out for your family and the importance of that, specifically um, in the Black culture, with the the things that have happened in our history and that even still happen today. When I saw this photo, I thought about how important it was and is to be in community and in communion with one another in a sense that is uh, a way to provide protection and safety. When I saw this picture, I I didn't I didn't really have the word all the words, but it was a very striking photograph and something about it feels like this is also a piece that 
um, I've kind of put in my research drawer to really um, to inform a, a particular section of my piece, the present section of my piece. And um, I think that this particular uh, photograph was just so it was just such a striking photograph. Um, so, yes, between the two artists, they, they both of them just had such grounding and exciting work. And there are aspects of each of their work that I have decided to put into the layering and the creation of this particular capstone project. So I'm going to move into talking a little bit about my proposal. Um, you've already heard from Emily uh, what the general consensus of it is, but um, the reason that I called it homage is that I, similar to my other works, every piece that I've done in some way has paid homage to those that have come before us. And in this particular work, um, I imagine that that will be something that carries through, that it's an homage to the people who have come before us. The rest of the title, which is, which I like to say it as what was, is to come, acknowledges the past, the Black experience in the past, the Black experience in the present, and the Black experience in the future. So each section is going to be performed in different areas of the museum. The first area where we'll do the past exhibit is going to be on the front plaza. So in this area right over here, probably some things on these steps and amongst these columns and also using some of this pathway right here. I was interested in starting with the past first and that being on the outside of the museum so that everything else that we do beyond there is taking us on the journey. Um, so we'll start here in the past. And this is another, um, just another photo of the, the first area that we'll be dancing in. The second area that we're going to be performing in is the Alice Bimal Courtyard. And this is where we'll be doing the present section of the, of the project. And in this section, um, you know, one of my goals is to talk about what what our black experience is like today. I'm going to be highlighting um, things in and around the Black Lives Matter movement um, and really just bringing forth life to those events that we we've all been privy to. This is another um, photograph of the courtyard. And then the last area that we're going to be embarking on is this beautiful area called the Great Hall. And this is where we will embark on the Black future or my imagination of the Black future. And the reason I chose this particular section was because, one, the regality of this area was just as soon as I saw it, it was just so striking. I was like, oh, that's definitely that's this has got to be the place where we end, where we land. What drew me was the steps and this idea of rising above, this idea of ascension. And that has been a constant in Black history, but particularly in the idea of thinking about the Black future, um, I wanted to highlight this idea of constant rise, constant rising above, constant ascension. Um, and in addition, it was just a really beautiful area. I love the regality of it. And in my mind, our Black future has hope and it has a regality it has a sense of peace it has a sense of joy and so i felt all those things when i first saw this area and this is another photograph of the great hall so i have um a decent cast for this piece um i have five really wonderful dancers um i chose these five dancers uh, particularly because they are young in their artistry and because this project is centered around Black futures, I wanted to make sure that the people who were involved in this work 
had the opportunity to come into it um, with, with a fresher mind, a fresher intent. And they are the they are the future of dance. And so um, I think it's going to be a really great opportunity for them to, to dive into this work um, and to think about what their Black future looks like and how they want to walk into that Black future and who they are in that Black future. Um, so far, what we have been working on um, as we built this project is we have started with talking about creating our Black futures and what that looks like. We wrote some stories. We've uh, shared some perspectives. Um, we have started very much in process with it, um, not trying to have any specific answers, but really going on the journey of creating this atmosphere together. Um, in our next couple of rehearsals, uh, my goal is for us to kind of work backwards. So we're gonna work from this hopeful black future, and then we're gonna start focusing on the present and what, what, how, what our black experience today how it has infiltrated into our lives and how we sit inside of it. And then our, le our next rehearsal after that, we're going to be focusing on looking at the past and how the past has infiltrated into this black future that we've created so that we have this through line and we start with the imagination. Um, I, I personally like to be in process with my work and I've, I can do it both ways. I've, I've made work very quickly in a week and then I've also had a whole semester to make work. So what I'm really looking forward to with this cast and with this particular project is that we're gonna get to go on the journey together. And um, I'm hopeful that as we go on this journey of building this piece together, that the audience will get to experience this journey as well. Um, this cast is going to be accompanied by a spoken word artist. Her name is Vinay Pate, and she is a longtime friend of mine. I've known her for 10 years now. Um, she was a dancer with me in the second company, and she is a woman of the arts. She is a singer. She is a spoken word artist. She is a dancer. She is a writer. She is, you know, she, she is a full artist in itself. And I really love her perspective on life. And um, I'm really looking forward to getting to create dialogue with her. So she will be essentially a tour guide for the audience. So the first dancing exhibit will happen in the front plaza. And that will be the past. She will have a little bit of interplay with the dancers, almost like a narrator. And then she will physically guide the audience from one dancing exhibit to the next dancing exhibit to the next dancing exhibit. And our hope is that she is guiding them with her voice, but she's taking them through the journey of our history as we go from the past to the present to the future. So um, she is a, is, a, is a huge part of this um, proposal or this project. And um, I really wanted there to be a through line of a person who takes us from, takes the audience from one place to the next to the next. So it feels like you're really at an art exhibit and you have a tour guide that's talking you through all the things that you are seeing and experiencing. Um, so that's her role. Um, my brother, Wesley Winfrey, who I'm, I've mentioned before, he is going to be creating an original sound score for this project. So I'm looking forward to working with him again. This will be our fourth project together. Uh, we, Like I said, we just did a project with DCDC and that was really, really amazing. And so uh, I'm looking forward to embarking on this journey with him as well. Um, so those are the artists that I'm going to be working with. And just to kind of sum up uh, why the one of the main questions that they asked that was asked in the proposal that really stuck out to me was, why is black art so integral to our black future? And I knew immediately what my perspective was when I saw that question and something that I think about on a very consistent basis was is like all of the all of the music that I grew up listening to, all of the black movies that I've seen, all of the black art that I've gotten to witness, all the concerts I've gone to, all the dancers I've seen, all the dance pieces that I've been in and have been about our African American experience. All those things are really what taught me the bulk of my knowledge of Black history. 
I learned a little bit in school and then I learned a little bit more in college when I took a specific African-American studies class. But other than that, all of the knowledge that I have and in my family, my grandmother and, you know, my father and my mother, they, they've all talked to me about our African-American history. But had it not been for those arts, I mean, there are just things I would not have known. Um, so I feel so grateful to now be in a position where I can contribute to the preservation of our history as African-Americans. And so I think that Black artists are important for our Black future because as we all know, there are more and more efforts to, to remove our history from the history books per se and, and from the school systems. And so if we don't have these movies and these songs and this poetry and these artists and these movies and these dances that really talk about and celebrate our lives and talk about our past and even start to project what our future could look like, then very slowly those things will start to die. And I think that preservation is so important for progression. Um, if you've heard of Adinkra symbols, there's an Adinkra symbol called the Sankofa, and it refers to looking back in order to move forward. And I am a big proponent of that. And I use looking at the past to inform my work. And so now I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to take a step into looking into the future and to creating the kind of Black future that I want to see. So thank you so much for joining me for my artist talk. I hope it was informative and, um, and I enjoyed sharing with you. Countess, thank you so much for sharing that insight into your work and into your process and into your ideas. I'm so excited to see this project unfold. Um, I will encourage our audience members. We have a few questions coming in, but do please take advantage of the form that's on your event page. And you might not see it if you had expanded the event to see it full screen. So if you shrink it back down, you'll see that little form where you can submit your questions. We're very happy to take them. Um, in the meantime, though, if you'll indulge me, I actually wondered, Countess, about a little bit about teaching, because I'm thinking about the ways that artists and, and specifically dancers have these teaching careers that exist sort of in parallel with their creative careers. And I wondered, is there anything that in the process of working with your students that as you were teaching them, you learned about yourself? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it was interesting because you know, with teaching, you never know like what's going to stick <laughs> and what's going to like move over their heads and also how open they'll be to receiving. And so I would say both in teaching and in the process of making the piece, you know, I just ask them questions and I ask them questions with the hope that they're OK with being completely honest about them. Uh, and, and I leave room for them to not be ready to answer those questions. So something that I learned is that they, they found a way to be completely unapologetically vulnerable in, in this process that we were creating that work. And what I learned was like, wow, I, I, I was reminded how much of a safe space dance can be and how sometimes you don't always know how to articulate certain things, but when you're working in dance and you're uh, using it as an avenue to create and express, there is something that helps you create the words to be able to express something that may you may not have been able to express in another way. So watching them have these kind of moments of vulnerability, but also revelation reminded me of the power of dance and that it, it is a language. And they really decided to allow that to be a part of their language and the way that they share. So it was a nice reminder, but also a learning experience in that, okay, Countess, next time that you're on this end, you know, you can, you can allow yourself to be just as vulnerable, not just when you're in the front of the room, but also when you're the student. Thanks. Um, oh, I, I want to ask, mostly I'm seeing, congratulations, this is wonderful, but I do have one question that I'd like to put out there to you. Um, 
the message says, congrats, Countess, your work is always so honest and intentional. Will you talk a little bit about some of your grounding practices for times when the work gets overwhelming and it's signed off? Congrats again, Q. Ooh, that's a good question. Oh, wait. Well, I pray a lot <laughs> and um, I call my mom and I tell her like, oh my gosh, it's not going to be good. And she's always like, oh, it's going to be great. You know, I talk to friends. Um, one thing that I really am so grateful for in my dance community, uh, specifically, you know, my DC, DC dance community is that it's a very loving and supporting one. So if I feel like I'm at a place where it becomes overwhelming, sometimes I just talk to them. You talk to whoever I decide to share with in that moment. And um, there's something about being able to talk it out, just like the same way that you journal and something about writing that helps you feel just a little bit more like you got your feet on the floor. Um, that some being able to commune with them and to talk to them about what I'm experiencing in a very human and vulnerable way uh, is really grounding. And it's something that they're very good at doing is being like, hey, you're a person first. So do what you need to do for yourself outside of the work, put it down, take a bath, go get a massage or let's talk about it and then come back to it later. Um, so I, I so in, in short, grounding practice practices, prayer, sometimes stepping away from it, having a conversation about it um, and just getting a different perspective to, to view it from, because sometimes I'm viewing it and I'm like trying to get every little thing. And then somebody will say, but this is really great. This concept is really great. So maybe you need to focus on a different portion of the concept so that you're not so taken aback by this one thing. So that I'm always appreciative of. So those things are where I usually like to start. Great. I, I see a couple more questions sliding in, but I'm afraid that we need to wrap for now because we're going to reset for the second part of our evening. Um, so I will, I'm going to pull up some of our, um, okay, perfect. So I want to say again, thank you so much, Countess, and thank you to our audience members for your participation. I'd also like to acknowledge DeMarco Payton, who is definitely managing the behind the scenes tech to make the magic happen. Please check CincinnatiArtMuseum.org to find the most up-to-date information about upcoming Black Future Series events. Registration information for attending the May 6th performance of Homage, What Was, Is, to come will be available in the coming weeks. And I do encourage you to come back then. You could ask your questions of the choreographer on that evening too. Um, so we will pause now to reset for the second part of tonight's program. Rodney Veal, April Berry, Jaquita Mullinsley, and Tamara Williams will be joining us at eight for a conversation about successful approaches to requests for proposals. We hope you'll join us.